Gratitude and Generosity in Cross-Cultural Exchanges is a presentation I've been working on a bit and uh, gave it about a week and a half ago to a group of people and uh, it's very much a work in progress that I'm uh, using as a sort of foundation to work through some of the thoughts and ideas, uh, reflections I've had on experiences over the past few years. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about bearing witness, acting in solidarity, and building community around the context of uh, gratitude and generosity and cross-cultural exchanges. And to sort of give some background here, for a number of years now I've been uh, traveling to Nicaragua and for the past several years I've been taking groups of students down there in uh, January and uh, we've been really evolving a model of uh, learning that sort of transitions us from uh, concept of learning, service learning, to learning in solidarity. And that's the result of a number of discussions and experiences I've had both with uh, some Nicaraguan colleagues and participants and the students and uh, colleagues here in the United States of America looking at what is it that we can effectively do, how can we act and behave in a way that um, honors both what is being offered when we travel to another country or another culture. Uh, it doesn't have to be another country, it can be another culture that's existent in our communities and we have a lot of diversity here in New York State. Um, and how I can act and behave in a way that honors both sides of the equation and actually gets at some sort of sense of forward movement or progression as we go through these exchanges. It's always necessary to talk about power and in any of these things uh, as soon as we travel to another community, another another culture uh, we bring with us, and by we I'm talking about those of us who are first world and privileged, and specifically I, who am a white male, also carry the first world privileged power with me. Uh, and it's something that cannot be set aside. And this is a, a thing that back in my early 20s, I really thought it was possible to go native, to become somebody other than who I am. And it's taken 30 some odd years to learn the truth is that I cannot be other than who I am. So I can't take all of my privilege and power and just put it to the side and be different than who I am. So the real question is, when we talk about cross-cultural exchanges and engagement, is how do we employ this power? In what way do we use all this privilege that we carry with us? I want to start out sort of framing it with something that Martin Buber said. And when I was originally thinking about this presentation, I uh, immediately went to, immediately went to uh, Parker Palmer and some of the ideas he has about creating communities of truth and things like that, um, broadened it out a bit to include Martin Buber and, by ex well, not by extension, but directly connected to that is the works of Paulo Friari, uh, always a sort of cornerstone of where I'm moving from lately, uh, the past few years. So we'll start out with Buber who said, I can look on a tree as a picture, a stiff column in a shock of light or a splash of green shot with a delicate blue and silver of the background. I can perceive it as a move, as movement, flowing veins, unclinging, pressing pith. I can classify it in a species and study, as a, study it as a type in its structure and mode of life. I can subdue its actual presence and form so sternly that I recognize it only as an expression of law. I can dissipate it and perpetuate it in number. In all of this, the tree remains my object, occupies space and time, and has its nature and constitution. It can, it can, however, also come about if I have both will and grace, that in considering the tree, I become bound up in relation to it. The tree is no longer it. I have been seized by the power of exclusiveness. And there's something there that, there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, but there's something there that directly ties us back to Friari and the concept of uh, subjects and objects and how we interact with people. So, again, it's it's Buber's concept of I, it, I, thou, and the Friarian concept of subject and object, which is not exclusively Friarian. Uh, but it helps frame this discussion a little bit on how we interact in other cultural settings and how we receive the generosity and express the gratitude, our standpoint, where we're acting from. And if we act with an open heart 
and the realization that we are dealing with other subjects, with other thous, and not it, it really transforms how we both experience different cultures, but in our returning home, how we choose to act and move forward at that point. And again, I sort of jumped ahead here and started talking about encounter a little bit, but the idea of encounter is travel brings us, whether we're going across town in our car to visit a different community or we're jumping on a plane and flying to another country, travel is encounter. And each encounter we have during our travel is a call evoking response. And each response is based in and reveals the traveler's your or my intent. So this is where we come back to the idea of, all right, am I traveling and interacting with a sense of the other as full person, full human, who can respond as a peer, as an equal? Or are we traveling to just experience a place and the inhabitants, the people who live there, fade into the background, become scenery, become it. So when we start exploring our intent, um, we are generally intentional in our cross-cultural encounters. And again, I was trying to figure out a decent spectrum for this, and it's very difficult. And so sort of what I came up with right now is a spectrum that goes from tourism to service to this other question. And the question is where I'd like to live but it's uh, easy to travel for for tourism, to just go and see a place and experience a little bit. Um, service moves it to a next level where you're actually going and doing things in communities. The question mark is where we can really understand, I think, we can really understand our intentions. We can really meet the other and understand what is being given to us and what is being called from us, and then acting from that basis. So we're not going to serve, we're not going to build a building, we're not going just to have a nice time surfing, but we are going to be, we are going to experience, we are going to be ourselves in the context of another community and fully understand, or at least attempt to fully understand, our intentions and the interactions that we're engaging in. And it's entirely possible that during any movement to a different community, through a different community, you can span a range of these intentions during your time there. And of course, any movement outward calls a change in us. So we are constantly transforming ourselves as we are engaging in cross-cultural situations. And I want to go back. Well, I don't want to go back. I just want to toss this out here. Mistaken intentions and false generosity. These are... Uh, Two things that I find very important to keep in mind. Uh, Back in 1968, Ivan Illich gave an address uh, called To Hell with Good Intentions. And he very uh, boldly laid out to a bunch of American volunteers who were in Cuernavaca uh, this idea that you can't really come here and change things. You can come to look, you can come to enjoy the flowers, come to study, but don't come to help. It's not help that we are bringing. And that jumps us to Friari and the concept of uh, a false generosity versus a true generosity. And this brings us to one of those issues that is a little more politicized than what we tend to think about, but how we, how we engage, what our service does. Um, Does it call into question the underlying structures and systems that have created a situation where service is necessary? And often what we, what I've seen in service projects, some service projects, and we're not going to generalize here, uh, but there is this tendency in service to emphasize a focalized view of problems and issues. Oh, they need housing. Oh, they need vaccinations, X, Y, and Z do that and then go away, which in no way touches the underlying systemic problems that have created the situations. So service is is a somewhat um, problematic term, and I prefer not to use it when I talk about uh, my experiences or when I 
am traveling with people to different cultures. I try not to talk about service. I am very much moving more towards experiential learning and, and solidarity. So as I mentioned before, I've taken a couple of student groups down there, down, down there, down to Nicaragua. Um, and these groups are uh, a little bit different than service groups. We don't go to do service. We are not service learning. It's much more an experiential process where we are going to be. We don't build anything. We go, we interact, we engage in conversations and discussions, uh, a lot of activities with kids and things like that. But it is not, we're not going to build anything. We're not going to vaccinate people. We're not going to uh, change. We really are going theoretically to open ourselves to the experience of being there, being in Nicaragua, being with the people of Nicaragua, and trying to evolve this, this model of service uh, and push it more to towards solidarity. And the experience is really meant to set the seeds of action at home. And of course, when we travel and when we go to a different community, a different culture, we are acting, but we want the, the transformative action to take place within the person and then be carried home as seeds which can then be planted and hopefully bloom in our communities where we live, in how we interact, in our cultures, in our workplaces. Um, and, and in the experiential process, in the, in, the, in the process of being there, it's always important to try to know and try to identify the powers that are in play. What power do I have? How is this altering the interaction? Um, and the mere process of me being who I am refracts or distorts the experience. So I, to jump back to a couple slides ago, I cannot have an authentic Nicaraguan experience. I cannot authentically experience Nicaragua as a Nicaraguan living in that context experiences it. I can, however, have an authentic experience of myself in Nicaragua. And I think it's important to keep that fact in mind, that I am always myself experiencing what I experience in a different culture. As far as receiving generosity, in my experience, it's, it's us. It's the privilege from North America. We who travel to these other communities, these other cultures, who are most often the recipients of true generosity. When we are traveling in different cultures, when we are moving through um, different communities, we are most often being greeted with generosity that is coming from the heart, that is coming from an attempt to build a bridge across the cultures to connect with us in a very human way. And about the only thing I believe we can do is return gratitude. And it has to be honest gratitude, and we have to be aware of the gifts that we are being given. It exceeds any sort of economic interaction. can't put a dollar on it, but we are being treated very generously, at least in my experience. Uh, people are opening their homes, opening their hearts to us. And all that's called back from us is a sense of gratitude for, for the gifts that we are being given. So now what? We've talked a little bit about things... So, now, what do we do? I think dialogue. Dialogue, both in communities we're visiting and in our home communities, is fundamental. And Freire said, dialogue is the encounter between men mediated by the world in order to name the world. So it's this process of, and of course, Freire writing when he was back in 1968-ish, uh, we would change that to the encounter between people or between men and women mediated by the world. This is what we are trying to get at, is a sense of dialogue uh, that bridges cultures, that allows us to name the world together as equals, as active subjects, in order to create the changes that are necessary to move things forward. And in looking at some of the fundamental elements for creating genuine or, or true, honest dialogue, uh, there are a lot of things written about this, but I just wanted to highlight the idea of concern, trust, respect, appreciation, affection, and hope. 
some of these things are not things that we're necessarily comfortable with talking about in our workplace, in our day-to-day lives, in our um, in our case, we're surrounded by academia, so the, the ideas of uh, affection and hope, uh, concern, those don't necessarily pop up, but they're essential for true, honest dialogue to occur. And hope is one of those elements, and, and I think we don't talk enough about hope in a very genuine way. Um, the hope that is somewhat utopian, the hope that is that world that we want to build that is there within us, that is somewhat of our uh, vision of our perfect world, of our place we want to live. And we may not necessarily, may not necessarily be living in the place we want to live, but um, one of the experiences we, we can hope to have uh, when we move across cultures is the sort of fracturing of our standard day-to-day functioning and an opening that can be very painful, but an opening that can also be very hopeful and that moves us towards a a newer vision. Um, And Ferrari said, dialogue cannot exist without hope. Hope is rooted in men's and women's incompletion, from which they move out in constant search, a search which can only be carried out in communion with others. And these others are fully acting as subjects, not objects. We are not going to objectify and look at how we can exploit, uh, how we can do these things, but we are going with an open heart to create a dialogue that can then build that hope, that can then sustain our hope as we move forward. And as we move forward, we always eventually come home. And so when we're home, the concept of uh, solidarity in our actions um, is really one way that we can express our gratitude for the generosity that we've been shown when we moved into different cultures. And one of the sort of cornerstone quotes I use on, on solidarity is uh, Samora Machel, the Mozambique president from 1975 to 1986, said, International solidarity is not an act of charity but an act of unity between allies fighting on different terrains towards the same objectives. And that really encapsulates it, Um, really gets to the core of what solidarity is. And solidarity solidarity really does deepen and transform service. It gives us a lens through which uh, what has been seen and experienced can create a bridge. There is no other world, there is no place to go. There's only the struggle of of us as human beings working together to build a world. And the idea of witness is also tied up into this concept of solidarity. We return home, we act in solidarity, and we bear witness to what we have seen, to what we know can be. Now I'll finally mention Parker Palmer in passing, since we started out with him, and he was one of the uh, foundations that kick some of this thinking into context. Uh, Parker Palmer said, the hallmark of community of truth is in its claim that reality is a web of communal relationships and that we can know reality only by being in community with it. So we can build communities of truth that act to, in solidarity, sustain hope and support dialogue and transform the world. We can build those communities when we're traveling, when we're moving through different cultures, but we can also bring that um, sense of solidarity, the hope that we have, and and the dialogue back to our own communities to help transform the world. And just as we're, as I'm getting ready to wrap up here, I'd like to um, quickly mention the impact of uh, the internet and and web-based technologies as an enabler in some contexts for maintaining communities of truth that can span distance and maintain connectedness. Um, In the case of of some of the students that we've taken to Nicaragua in the past couple of years, there have been sustained connections between the North American participants and our our Nicaraguan collaborators uh, that has been largely facilitated by Facebook. Uh, Conversations can still go on, the sharing of of information, the sharing of, of memories, the sharing of new 
events and activities, it still occurs and is still an active process. So there is some power uh, that technology brings to us to maintain that sense of connectedness to other communities and bring that back into our world as we return home. And I just wanted to finish up by expressing that gratitude to Don Teofilo. He's an unknowing mentor for much of my work on this subject. Uh, I've met him a couple, uh, twice now, only twice, but uh, the first time I met him was an incredible moment uh, and was really uh, transformative for me personally. And I'd love to tell his story at some point, but uh, I won't uh, bore you with details now. I just wanted to express my gratitude to him and his family for enabling me to understand things in a slightly different way and start developing some of these thoughts. And I want to thank you very much for your attention and time. Here's some contact information if you have any comments or questions. I'd be more than happy to receive those and, and respond to them. And uh, thank you very much.